Welcome back. Today, we are going to harness the power of the core. And the first thing we are going to need is some Tiberium. This can be obtained on Ross's moon, which requires a tier 5 rocket. We quickly craft it and then launch to our new adventure. Once we arrive at the new destination, the first thing we notice is how fast the day passes here. And, after some prospecting, we quickly find some Tiberium. After collecting some of it, we quickly craft the new fuel rods. Then, after doing a backup, we try to see how it behaves inside a nuclear reactor. And it looks like our current system can barely handle those rods. The real issue is that, due to the huge heat produced by such fuel, if our coolant system were to fail, the reactor will instantly evaporate. To contain the mess in case of explosion, we can add some reactor platings. Or, by adding enough heat capacity plates, we can make our reactor able to tank up to 4 seconds of exposure to such powerful fuel. And that should be enough time for our thermal protection to trigger. And thus, we came up with this design, where there are 6 rods, each with 4 dedicated coolant cells. The power output is 600,000 EU per tick, doubling what we had before. However, that didn't last long. It looks like some heat managed to escape to the reactor hull and triggered our thermal protection. And the culprit seems to be our underpaid vacuum freezer, which is still working only on MV wage. So, we gave it a rise to EV. However, our power balance is now negative again. So we must find a more powerful design. And, after some crafting, we can finally use the 40 rods famous one. This configuration is extremely dangerous, because there is nothing saving our base if the reactor were to run with a too low amount of coolant. To do a quick test, we are going to run the reactor for a second with the help of a button and a screwdriver. And here we can see that our coolants took quite the hit from just that small run. We can do a second push, and see that we are already over half of the coolant but the power output is really high. Now we shall try to find a way of automating that thing. To do so, we need three buttons and lamps. The first one will run the reactor. The second one will extract the coolant. And it appears that this is going to need more than a push to finish its job. Once the exhaust is out, we can use the third button to insert new fresh coolant cells. Managing to automate cells that get burned up so fast is going to be too risky and hard, so we shall instead switch to some bigger ones. The issue is that those require fluxed electrum, which has to be cooked in a ZPM trinium coil DBF. And trinium coils require a ZPM assembler. Since we already have all the requirements, we quickly rush the ZPM assembler. Which we use to upgrade our volcanoes. Thus allowing for the crafting of the best coolant cells. Now that we have better coolant, we can start using levers instead of buttons. We carefully turn on the reactor and watch as it works. And, when we turn it off, some fire happens. Fear not, that was just our thin cable that couldn't handle the power output of our reactor. We shall switch to the only cable capable of handling so many amps, Superconductor 16X. Once the new cable is in place, we can go back to our tests and move to stage 2, extracting the used coolant. Finally, in the third stage, we insert new fresh coolant and we are ready for another iteration of the loop. However, that is not how we are going to do it. We want it to be automatically managed by a timer. But we can't be careless and just directly connect it. We will want to have some extra sensors, namely, something that stops the thing if we run out of coolant. After some fiddling, we set up a system that will output a signal if we have less than a change of cells. While at it, we also add a lever to manually shout down the reactor. Then we connect everything up. And it was finally time to let that thing run on its own. Since one whole iteration takes 7 seconds, we can speed it up by 7 times.
And now there are two main issues. The first one is that we are not receiving the power output. Which turned out to be a limitation of the plug of our battery. This setup is making 150 amps and we could only absorb spikes of 80. The second issue is that this setup is not going to produce our 150 amps LUV constantly but only one quarter of the time. Now, exactly like a four strokes engine, that is okay if we have a light load with some inertia, but not when we need a lot of power. So, to make a good nuclear engine, we are going to need three more cylinders filled with cylinders of cylinders of enriched naquada. That required a lot of Tiberium. And here came the realization, cooking all the tungsten steel for those cylinders is going to take quite some time. Too much time. To do that in a reasonable amount of time, we shall have a bigger blast furnace. That thing is going to cook our tungsten steel twice as fast, but it is also making way more pollution. Also, we are now using more power than what our single four strokes reactor can make. And after some time, we finally managed to finish our inline four engine. Now, let's see in the details how that thing works. Every reactor has the same setup of the one we had before. However, we changed the working conditions and the four reactors have a 90 degrees phase offset. The new condition is that, instead of just checking the coolant level, we have a red wire that will allow for running. That red wire is the output of an AND gate of a lever, our coolant level and our battery level. For both the levels, we have an RS latch that will allow for smoother working. And we wait up to 30 seconds before re-enabling the reactors if we run low on coolant. And, since the coolant is swapped even if the reactor doesn't run, we can filter the unused cells to not go through the vacuum freezer. That's how the setup works with a 7x speed up. And, while that thing can keep our batteries well charged up, we can do even better. We can do so by using a more optimal fuel layout. In this configuration, each rod has exactly three nearby rods and one coolant cell, that way, the fuel is pushed to the maximum. Also, every coolant cell has exactly one rod to cool, making it last the longest time possible. That will also lead to cells taking all the exact same damage, making it possible to easily filter them out of the reactor when they reach critical damage. Finally, we can fill the reactor with enough heat capacity plates to make it able to withstand the loss of one cell. Meaning that we can try to automate the cell swap while the reactor runs. And, for more ease, we must ensure all the cells are at a different damage level, so that only one has to be replaced or can fail every reactor tick. And it was then that I was unsure if it was an error or not following error's advice. Anyways, this setup seems to make quite enough power. And to finish off, we add a condition that will turn on the reactors only when our battery reaches a quarter of charge. And that is quite some toggling. But, with such a setup, there is no need for latches. Anyways, I think we have fixed the power issues for at least one episode. See you next time. Bye bye.